this online conversation on Christianity and the case for democracy. My name is Dan Struble, and I am Associate Dean for External Relations at the Duke Divinity School. Duke Divinity School is pleased to work with the Trinity Forum in its effort to connect leading thinkers with thinking leaders. We have been partnering with the Trinity Forum for several years now and delight in engaging with Trinity Forum's members in these active conversations. Duke Divinity School is proud to be one of Duke University's 10 schools. Today, a Divinity School faculty member and a member of our Board of Visitors will be joined by a member of Duke's Sanford School of Public Policy. Cherie will introduce them shortly. Duke Divinity School is one of the world's leading theological schools. Its faculty write many of the books that are taught in seminaries around the world and used by lay and ordained Christians in their ministries. Its graduates are leading churches and nonprofits in multiple denominations around the nation and the world. We offer seven degrees at the master's and doctorate level, joint degrees in law, public policy, and social work, and hybrid and non-degree options for those who wish to deepen their theological knowledge while continuing to live and serve in their communities. I'd like to thank Neely Tao, member of our Board of Visitors, and her husband, Rolf, for sponsoring this online discussion today. Now, please welcome Cherie Harder, President of the Trinity Forum, to introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. Thanks so much, Dan. And on behalf of all of us at the Trinity Forum, we wanted to welcome you to today's online conversation on Christianity and the case for democracy. If you are new to the Trinity Forum, we work to create a space and resources and a context to discuss the big questions of life in the context of faith, and ultimately to come to better know the author of the answers. And certainly one of the questions that press on our minds with increasing intensity and urgency in this unusually chaotic and even nasty election season is how we as Christians should think about not just our public and political engagement, but deeper, more foundational questions. How do we live as fellow citizens with those who hold to very different views of the common good? How do we work towards a shared vision of the good while also holding to what we believe is true and just? And how should our ongoing experiment in liberal democracy be ordered to encourage justice and flourishing for all? There are those on both ends of the ideological, political, and religious spectrum who have, have argued recently in a number of best-selling books that liberal democracy has run its course some have argued that a system paralyzed by gridlock needs a strong leader to bust through norms and rules in order to get things done. Others have claimed that our system has been so polluted by unfairness and historical injustice that new approaches are needed uh, altogether. But our speakers today will advance and discuss the argument that for all of its imperfections, there is a vitally important Christian case to be made for democracy and that the Christian conception of human dignity and worth and the primacy of loving relationship gives us important reasons for reaffirming democratic self-government. It's a provocative claim in a polarized time, and it is an honor and a pleasure to dig in and get to discuss with our guest today, Luke Bretherton, Deandra Rose, and Ann Snyder. Luke is a professor of moral and political theology and a senior fellow of the Kinnan Center for Ethics at Duke University. He's a prolific writer for both scholarly and popular audiences and has written for journals such as Modern Theology, the Journal of the American Academy of Religion, The Guardian, The Times, ABC, as well as producing a number of full-length scholarly works, including Hospitality as Holiness, Christianity and Contemporary Politics, which won the Ramsden Prize for Theological Writing, Resurrecting Democracy, and his latest work, Christ and the Common Life, Political Theology and the Case for Democracy, which we've invited him here today to discuss. Responding to Luke will be Deandra Rose and Ann Snyder. Deandra is a professor of public policy and political science at Duke, where her research focuses on the effects of landmark social policies on the American political landscape. 
She's also the recipient of numerous teaching and scholarly awards and is the author of Citizens by Degree, Higher Education Policy and the Changing Gender Dynamics of American Citizenship. Ann Snyder is the editor-in-chief of Comet Magazine and oversees their new initiative, Breaking Ground, a visionary effort aimed at community building around Christian social thought. She's the author of The Fabric of Our Character, serves as a 2020 Emerson Fellow, a fellow at the Center for Opportunity Urbanism, and I am very proud to say, a senior fellow of the Trinity Forum. Luke, Deandra, and Anne, welcome. So let's just jump right in. Luke, in the introduction, in fact, I think the very first sentence of your book, you set out a fairly ambitious goal of offering a reflection on the purpose of politics, as well as making the case for democracy. So let's just start at the very beginning. What do you believe the purpose of politics to be? And why should Christians be committed to democracy of all forms of government? No, thank you. And it's wonderful to be with you all and, and have this chance to have this conversation. It feels particularly relevant at this, at this moment in time. So to dive straight into your question, I think really when, when we say the word politics, what often kicks off in our heads is we think of party politics and the kind of fractious world that we're seeing played out on the news channels and in social media or we think about what takes place in Washington DC or Paris or London or Lagos i.e. the kind of departments of state and bureaucracy and kind of the mechanisms of government or even we might think of law courts and all of this is a is a crucial element of politics it's what in the book I call statecraft um, but it's not the whole of politics that's that's just one way of uh, really doing the kind of more basic and fundamental and broader vision of what politics is which is this negotiation of a, of a common life amid asymmetries of power, different status. Some people got more land than others or more money than others or more political access than others. So we've got difference of power and competing or rival or different visions of the good. My vision of human flourishing is different from an Islamic vision of different flourishing flourishing of, and myriad others. And so politics is, is really this response and, uh, to kind of the nature of difference. And when we encounter someone who's different from us, we've got four basic choices. I can either kill you, and there's a lot of his, human history, which that's the answer. I can run away, so exit, you know, I can flee. Um, or I can create a system to coerce you uh, so I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to pay attention to you. I don't have to take you seriously. Or politics, i.e. I can negotiate some kind of common life amidst our differences, amidst the asymmetries of power, where we recognize our interdependence with each other. And this, this is going on all around us. It's not just statecraft. So when pastors and elders get together in a church, uh, so there's a form of common life they have to decide, are we going to keep the pews in or take the pews out? These are often very fractious debates. I don't think this quite caused a schism, but people get very upset about these things. And there are differences of power that have to be negotiated. That's politics. They're doing politics. Nomads in a desert negotiating access to waterholes through practices of hospitality and gift exchange without killing each other, without coercing each other, without running away, they're doing politics. So we don't need states to have politics. There was a, a long modern story going back to Thomas Hobbes and others saying we have to have states and states is synonymous with politics. I'm saying I'm trying to recover an older, richer vision of politics. Aristotle gives a wonderful account of this, but it doesn't have to be the Greek tradition. There are any, anywhere where we see people coming together in some kind of council type form, deliberating and trying to work out how to live together, that's politics. And it's the alternative to killing, coercion or fleeing. Um, and again, we see those three other options around the world today. And this precious, very fragile work based on cultivating trust, that's politics. And I would say Christians have a you know, as a basic moral uh, act of neighbor love should be invested in the act of politics. And, and then democratic politics is this sense in which 
this value that everyone, not just aristocrats, not just technocratic elites, not just people in the know who have the cupbearer to the king or whatever it is, everyone uh, has the capacity and has wisdom to share about how we should order our common life. And so the kind of extension of who's involved in that negotiation is the democratic impulse in the recognition that no one has a monopoly on wisdom. Truth is hard to find. Uh, you can have a huge data set and confuse information for wisdom, but you don't necessarily know what it means to flourish uh, with others. Um, and lots of people with lots of different kind of knowledges can have wisdom to share about how we can live together amidst our differences, amidst na navigating difficult asymmetries of the power, uh, but in recognition that I can't survive, let alone thrive, without others on whom all our flourishing depends. Yeah, that's fascinating. So if, uh, just to sort of expand on that, and Anne, I'd love to direct this towards you. If part of what democracy requires is that kind of uh, relationship and community between each other to navigate those differences and negotiate them, uh, then relationships in common, civic institutions, community relationships are also quite important. I know you have dedicated much of your professional life to thinking about what happens when those ties, when those relational ties start, start to thin and fray and our community relationships sort of, we begin to atomize as a people. And would love to hear your thoughts about how we both as citizens and Christians can contribute to a reweaving of some of those connections that makes possible what Luke is talking about. Sure, I'll, I'll give it a go. It's a big question, Sheree. Thanks for having me. Um, if I could just for 20 seconds, I just wanna wear my editor hat and tell you Luke and everyone watching that the book is like really a masterpiece. Um, and you may have published it in 2019, but it's like probably only gonna get more timely as these days and weeks and months go. I spent a lot of my 20s um, just really desperate to understand the historical relationship between uh, American democracy and Christianity. I had found myself early in um, professional waters that sort of lumped these two together and I was scrambling to catch up to understand the courtship historically that had led to that sort of marriage. I'd grown up overseas and my exposure to Christianity was in the global context, not the American one. I did not have uh, particularly political parents. And so I just devoured many, many books um, and wound up really like landing on sort of historical, sort of religious historical work by the likes of Mark Knoll and Nathan Hatch and George Marsden, you know, all of whose work in fleshing out kind of the nuances of the stance between Christianity and democracy, not all of which is really very pretty, which they acknowledged. Um, and I just, I still commend that literature to anyone here, but your book Luke, just really builds on that in part because you just expand the source material. Um, I mean, you wove in the Black Power Movement and the Catholic social, uh, Catholic social thought and Anglican tradition and humanitarianism, both secular and faith-driven, um, all while giving someone like me who doesn't really have a strong political stomach um, just a grip to sort of understand the intellectual shoulders I'm standing on as a Christian in this democracy today. Um, and I think, you know, Sheree alluded to this very eloquently in her introduction, but I think a lot of us feel like we're walking on eggshells um, as we hear things on the one hand, like, democracy is a form of, is a white supremacist form of governance. It's an institution that has baked into it, you know, horrific hierarchies of human value and therefore it's unredeemable. You hear that on one side and then on the other, often from more sort of religious and Christian, uh, um, you know, parties on the right, you hear the sort of sense that liberal democracy has turned out to be a really wrong-headed judge of human nature, um, that it's the wrong container to support our innate need to be in healthy relationship with others. It focuses too much on the atomized individual and their rights. We actually need thick communities with thick and possibly impenetrable uh, moral coherence. And as I, I'm kind of caricaturing the two poles, but as I found myself hearing all this and frankly feeling a little soft before the disenchantment on both sides, I can sort of resonate with both both sides a little bit, I, but I just don't know a better alternative for a governance that allows people's innate dignity to be respected um, 
you just have really helped me and I think would help everyone watching at who would like to read it, just a really timely tour of the various sort of theological and cultural traditions um, within Christianity that have wrestled with the goods of democracy, um, but also it's failing to achieve its best potential. Um, many of which are finding, I think, caricatured expression today. So thank you. And then to answer your question, Sri, and I'll be as brief as I can, I, it's a huge question. I don't have all the answers, but I guess I, I would like to step back from it a little bit and just ground it in something very basic, namely, what is the Christian case for the common good? You know, why should Christians specifically care about the common good? And I raise it um, I think 10 years ago, if I would have heard it, I would have rolled my eyes and been like, it's so obvious. But I, I really fear that the affirmative answer to the question has been lost more recently, like somewhere along the way, as this society has become more and more diverse, and as many of our historic institutions have had trouble, I think, leaning into this ever proliferating divers diversity as sort of an invitational journey in a way that's wise and not agenda driven on the one hand or fear driven on the other. Um, you know, Mary, many American Christians have taken on a strange and I would say toxic posture that is at once bereaved and defensive and seems to presume that if we were dominant in political and cultural influence or if our values were the name of the day in the public square, mm -hmm. that the common good would just de facto be achieved. And I just don't see any historical evidence supporting this assumption. Um, you know, I think from time to time I quote this and it's a little apocryphal from a biblical standpoint, but there was a film that came out a few years ago called Paul, um, Apostle of Christ. And I have to say, it's probably not the greatest production values or like a piece of art, but there is a beautiful scene in it. It features the early Christian community in Rome in the first century. And there's a scene they feature, you know, the, the, the missionary couple that's in uh, the New Testament Priscilla and Aquila, and they're having a marital argument. Um, their brethren are being burned on the stakes in the streets. Their little fledgling community is being under threat of attack. And the husband and wife, Aquila and Priscilla, he's saying, we should just move to Ephesus, safer there, we could start afresh. And she's saying, no, I'm a Roman and I care about this city. I was born here, I'm gonna die here. I'm gonna serve it. And their sons who are like in their twenties and very lust filled and testosterone filled come in, this is in the film, but you can sort of imagine this may have happened. Uh, with, along with some other young men, and they say, we're tired of being, you know, we're tired of being um, uh, persecuted like this. And, we, you know, we're tired of turning the other cheek and all the things. Um, we need to rise up and, and, you know, take down the emperor. And it's this whole back and forth. And then Priscilla says at some point, and she sort of has tears in her eyes, sort of fighting with her sons. She's also worried about them. And she just says so simply, you know, Christ did not call us to rule the world, but to care for it. And, you know, it's not a Bible verse, I learned afterwards, <laughs> but, um, and it precedes like 2000 years of debating Romans 13. Um, but I was very moved by this line and I've come to it over and over again. And, um, you know, I think the common good today, which feels at once existentially important and gravely endangered, Christians have a responsibility to tend to it because we have a conception of persons and because human dignity is primary. Um, you know, I think we just can't get away from the fact that God created and loves each person and endows him or her with this divine image. And that's very basic and we all learned it in some Sunday school, but I think there's an enchantment in that belief that frankly, if you're operating within a sort of secular, what I might call even a pagan power frame, you just don't begin from that extraordinarily powerful and almost stilling place and understanding the other. And I'm not saying that in a Christian triumphalist way, but in sort of a deeply wonder-filled, grateful way that always gives us the ground to care for the freedom of individuals to live into their kind of God-given agency, um, which at least thus far, a healthy democracy is the best proven chance of supporting. And just the last thing I'll say, as I was speaking broadly rather than concretely, uh, Shri, to answer your question is, you know, I. I get to run this wonderful magazine called Comment and our tagline is public theology for the common good. And I've been a part of it as editor for a year, a little over a year. And I've come to sort of feel like if that for the common good tagline were the telos, telos of our lives as individuals and so many of our democratic institutions, um, how much would be different? Like mm -hmm. 
you know, mothering and neighboring for the common good? How does that shift the way in which you live on your block and raise your children? Running the New York Times for the common good. To be honest, I'm not sure that's happening right now. And that's really sad. You know, what would it look like to say you're equipping and forming college students at your, this college to serve the common good of a society where there is bound to be this discordant jazz of disagreement? Um, what does that mean? You know, how do you be a midwife for the common good, which means you're never privileging the white woman's baby over the black woman's baby, um, making policies for the common, et cetera. So I just sound simple, but sometimes naming something as the end that's sufficiently transcendent um, I think would be helpful for all of us in rejiggering our behavior. That's like a, almost like a communitarian golden rule applied to individual and institutional action. One of the things we are struggling with, and it's to build on the language of the common good, is I think, in, and it, it, I think it's there in the church more broadly, but I think it's a peculiar pathology in a sense in American Christianity, which is this conflation of pursuit of the common good with pursuit of the kingdom of God. And I think often, if, I'm, if, I, if politics is all about pursuit of the kingdom of God, then I can't compromise. It's not just we're having a disagreement about tax policy. This is, you are a metaphysical mistake. Now, there are secular versions of this, the, who's on the right side and the wrong side of history. You know, this, this kind of gets taken up in various ways in various modern ideologies. But but if, if it's just an argument about the common good rather, and, and the kind of penultimate goods, education, health, and, and the ultimate is not at stake in the penultimate, then we can do politics. Yeah. When the whole of politics is about the king, pursuit of the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. there's no politics. That, that kind of hyper-apocalyptic frame kills politics because mm -hmm. it's not about politics anymore. It's about metaphysics or it's about salvation. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when things get, oh, politics gets over-invested in, it becomes a vehicle of salvation, not a means of cultivating some kind of shared life while we you know, discern what you know, the ultimate is. Yeah, oh, that's, that's great. I mean, one of the sort of obvious questions that jumps out is, any sort of cultivation of a common life requires that we actually be able to uh, to see and hear what is going on in the lives of our fellow citizens, to be able to perceive what, what is needed and uh, where injustices um, arise. Uh, I really love all your thoughts on this, but Deandra, I perhaps can start with you in that, you know, one of the questions that sort of always confronted people of faith is how we respond to to poverty, to suffering, to injustice. There are many times where our response has been uh, quite wanting. Uh, but, you know, before that, you actually have to see it, to perceive it, to, you know, recognize it. And we are kind of in a, a time where not only are our social circles increasingly stratified, but um, our news feeds are increasingly siloed. You know, it, it becomes sort of ever easier to, um, you know, and, and not just easy to opt into, it happens to us with, unless there is a concerted effort to push against it, such that we, don't, we may not in counter the struggles of people not like us. Uh, so I am curious, just given your own scholarly research and work, how do we learn to see? Thank you so much for that question, Sheree. And I have to, just to echo Anne, I feel like this is such a masterpiece. And as a political scientist, I don't get very often to spend much time with theology, actually. And as a political scientist, I'm realizing just how short-sighted and, and what a, a, a problem that is, because there's so much to be gained um, from actually spending time with and grappling with works like this. So thank you so much, Luke, for this intervention. I think it's timely. I think it's, um, it's really pushed me to, to really embrace, you know, even more so like the responsibility that I have as a Christian who does work that's related to problem solving and policy. Um, so I just wanted to start with that thanks and recognition. But I, I love this question, Cherie, because I feel like, you know, I'm a political historian. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, what we know to be the state of affairs or the state of the problems that we face as a society in order to help, 
young people who want to be policymakers or change agents to grapple with those challenges. But I realized that in political history, you know, oftentimes history is written by the victors. Mm -hmm. And there are so many cases in which the received wisdom that we all you know, have before us is actually one that is shaped very clearly by political uh, forces or by different sort of um, structural situations that are, are really, um, that really reflect the fact that not everyone has had equal access to political voice or access to, um, as Luke discusses, the canon. So I have to say, like, one of my favorite quotes from the, the book is when Luke points out that, you know, modern intellectual history, political philosophy, and political theology presume an archive and therefore focus on those who had status of some kind or produce records. The challenge is how to listen to those who are without an archive and increase the range of figures who count as doing political theology. And I love this quote because I feel like there's such a valuable parallel in terms of political science, in terms of political thought, in terms of thinking about democracy. So for me, you know, to go back to your question, Cherie, it's like, how do we see? It's really recognizing what we don't see and that our current um, sort of set of knowledge or the bounds of our understanding are not complete because historically there have been people who have been at the margins of our society. So one of the responsibilities as a listener is to really create space for those marginalized voices. And I think if you're really doing this properly, if you're really listening actively, you know, I find it, I'm going to be honest, I can be a talker. I find really listening well difficult is a challenge because if you're really doing it properly, you're not spending time composing your next response. You're not thinking about how you're going to enter the conversation. You're really taking time to reflect on and, and respect what you're receiving from someone who you know, might be different from you. You might find a little strange or scandalous to use uh, Luke's description. So I think you know, recognizing what's omitted in terms of what we think we know. And I think you know, in the history of US social policy, there's so many powerful examples where expansions of or, or invitations of marginalized people into political spaces and into political institutions really pushes us in terms of our policies and the solutions that we develop. And that helps us to get things, you know, a little, a little more, helps us to be a little closer to solving problems for those who are marginalized. So I think that's where I, I think for me, just really thinking very seriously about listening and then what listening properly and listening well means for our capacity to act in ways that could lead to um, human flourishing and a more just society. Just to it, just to, uh, it's a one, wonderfully put down, Jordan. I, I'm, I was listening to you and I was, there's a terrible thing my dad used to say to me and it, it drove me insane until I grew up and realized he was right, which made me even madder, which is, he was just it, you know, cause I, I'm a big talker. And he would say, you've got one, God gave you one mouth and two ears and he meant something by that. And, uh, and, I, and there's, there's a kind of deep truth there, which I was kind of reminded of listening to you. Cause so often we, and I find myself doing, we have a kind of ideological checklist in our head and we're not actually really listening to understand. We're listening to tick off, does this person conform? Oh, we've got to item 32. No, I'm against them. Uh, and then I can come up with my argument as to why they're wrong. And that, that kind of listening is what in, in, in is kind of reinforced in social media worlds. But, but the listening where I'm attending to, and, I, and it's a sense in which, and, and that what Deandra was saying about the, the kind of marginalized voices are, have been systematically excluded. It's this listening which refuses even the possibility of resting with the wound that people are articulating and, and, and through a lament. Um, and there's obviously strong scriptural precedent for that of hearing laments, of hearing cries. And true listening begins in scripture, true change begins in scripture. Think about the cry of the Israelites, begins with hearing of cries. Um, and that, and, and, and our problem, I think, often has been is, is we, because we disagree with the analysis that those at the site of the wound bring, 
we don't even abide with the wound. And I think that's a lot of what's going on today is we, we, we're so caught up in disagreeing with someone's analysis of the problem that we don't actually, actually hear the cry from the site of the wound that underlies that. And, and that's something I've kind of worked with my students and say, look, you, you don't have to agree with, I don't have to agree with Trump supporters to, to understand that there's a, there's a wound there that this is a cry emerging from. I don't, you don't have to agree with Black Lives Matter, but there's a deep historic wound there that this is a cry that needs to be heard and at least to recognize there's a very deep wound here that is in need of healing. And then that's the place of the conversation. And I think that's, we're so used to listening with our ideological checklists, we somehow are deaf to the nature of the wound out of which these cries are coming. I love that framing so much, Luke, because I think one of the biggest challenges that we've seen, at least in the U.S. context, especially in the last 30 to 40 years, has been with rising inequality. There are so many populations that are really feeling a lot of discomfort, you know, economically, socially, um, you know, in terms of politically, in ways that I think create almost a competition. So it's very difficult to listen to the wounds of others to really hear and acknowledge when we all bring our wounds to the table. And I think sometimes there's this real tension between you know, our responsibility to care for and listen to and make space for others, but then also this responsibility to self. So I, I just love that so much. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, just to build on that, I think in, within that, it, it's off, it is often framed in a kind of competitive and people talk about kind of the victim Olympics and this kind of stuff, which, which kind of degrades political discourse. And I think when we have, and I, I see this in a very concrete way in, in something like community organizing or in various other forms of politics, when at the site, when actually once genuinely listening for the meaningful thing, the kind of point of grief, the, the sense of, and grief is, is actually anger, that it comes from the Norse word for anger it means it actually means grief which means something has been lost um and and what is one what is what 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 does one love and cherish that you feel has been lost or desecrated or trodden on in some way and when one is truly listening for that one can discover uh, between you know whether it's minors in Appalachia and um, those subjected to uh, the kind of negative impacts of, 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 of coal processing in Birmingham, Alabama, Bama, in Birmingham, Alabama, of predominantly black neighborhoods there, you can discover a common object of love. There's a sense in which their neighborhoods, their forms of life have been desecrated, and there's a shared problem of which they can come together uh, and work towards. And there's some really interesting projects that is that exactly doing that, actually um uh, by by christians at making those kinds of connections and so i think that that true listening and then the discernment of the common objects of love which might be f wrapped up in this shared grief of actually we're grieving the same thing that provides a space for real politics it's but often these are then taken up in highly ideological ways which prevent actually the identification of the common object of love or, or the common thing that's being grieved. We are going to be turning to audience questions shortly, but before we do so, I wanted to pick up on something that, um, that you said, Luke, and really that both uh, Deandra and Anne have alluded to as well, uh, which is you've argued that essentially democratic politics is a work of love and doesn't work without love. Um, and so several questions for this. I mean, one, we have certainly seen what appears to be an erosion of expressions of civic love. But let's just start with the basic question, which um, could be the Tina Turner question. What does love have to do with it? Um, and then what happens when love is gone? This is a, a point drawn from Augustine, really, mm -hmm. um, and his great magnum opus, the, the City of God. But all politics, I would argue, is um, formed around shared objects of love or what he called com common objects of love. And so it's not, I don't think, the, the, the question is not what, what happens when the love dies in a kind of romantic sense, but what, what, are the, what other loves come in? Does a love of money replace a love of country? Does a, a, a love of status replace 
uh, a love of um, uh, uh, the kind of fostering a sense of civic uh, uh, neighborly responsibility. Um, so it's politics, there's always love at work in politics. The question is, what do we love and how do we love it? Um, and, and that, I think, is a deep theological insight of political, political theology. So part of, part of uh, uh, kind of, uh, of, of politics is identifying what people love and cherish um, and how they're loving that. And are they loving it the right way or the wrong way? Do they love it too much? Do we love, it's good to love our country. It provides the roads, the legal systems, the education, the language on which we depend for our lives. But do we love it too little or do we love it too much? Nationalism and all sense of problems. So it's, it's, the, it's the quality and character of our loves and the objects of our loves that, that's in play here. Um, and then obviously, in a theological kind of register, um, the question is, do we love God first and then all other things ordered in relation to God? And so, and then do we confuse love of country, love of party, um, love of ideas, abstract commitments over love of neighbor? Um, and so we suddenly put a program, whether it's an ideological program, uh, an economic program, a legal program. We can think how loving rights too much becomes itself. We're not actually attending to the concrete realities of the person. So I think politics is always about the negotiation of what we love and how we love it. Um, in Christian terms, we have a very strong account of what should be the, the ultimate focus of our love and then how neighbor love is a step towards that. This question of listening um, is very key. Uh, and this, but but ultimately, I think there's there's a profound point of Christian witness at stake in it, mm -hmm. because if we um, refuse to listen to others and don't take time to really attune ourselves to where where is the other person coming from or where are these other people coming from, and and say that actually the differences between us define us, then what we're actually saying is. Um, it, it's, I would say there's something very profound at stake, which is that if Christ really is the one in whom all things are made and through whom all things are reconciled, then whatever differences there are at a penultimate human earthly level which divide us, there is a deeper truth and a deeper love which connects us. And that's what Christ to bear witness, Christians are to bear witness to, which is the love of Christ. And so when I say that our differences surmount what is connecting us, it's not ultimately that we're all humans together or a kind of come by our moment or that, you know, we're going to dis we will disagree about penultimate matters often very vehemently, but actually what the church should be saying, even if it's just to fellow Christians is that the love of Christ is deeper than all of that. And that failure to listen and the act of listening itself, bears witness to the possibility that there's something deeper and more important that connects us, which is the love of Christ. And so I think the very, the simple act of listening is in the contemporary context, one of the most radical acts of faithful witness we can undertake. That's great. Amen. That. Yes. Yeah. 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 I was just so beautifully said, Luke, and I, been thinking lately, this is more of a human point than a political one, although I hope it has bearing on our, political behavior. Um, but it's probably worth remembering that deep listening, usually if it's, if it's done in total authenticity, it's probably going to be costly or at the, at the least uncomfortable, especially when you're listening to, I, I'm thinking of a situation in my recent life a couple weeks ago where I, my husband and I were hosting a group of teenage boys who come from the roughest part of DC. It was like we were doing like a late summer camp weekend, uh, 10, 14 year olds um, who have no fathers who, and I was, I think in this year of social distancing, as I was like, you talk about listening to the grief and sharing in the grief. I was very kind of caught off my rocker. I guess, again, this is probably the thousandth time this has happened. Um, but in a search for truth and a search for love, ultimately, it causes extraordinary questions around one's own vocation and where one lives and, you know, all those sorts of things. And I think, you know, putting yourself in situations where you're seeing d dignified souls in our, in, in a lot of cases today, having no chance to 
bloom in our society because they're considered the dispensable ones or whatever. And I, th there's something in like deep finding myself almost not, I was struck by my own unwillingness at certain moments to listen because it might require something of me that I don't even know how to make sense of, but I'm sort of given comfort somehow again in sort of the Christian faith construct that the underlying when you when you are confronted with something that's like deeply disturbing and you feel like you have a re moral responsibility to respond and say make the world a better place or whatever it does I think it can I mean obviously hopefully it drives you back to prayer but it drives you to this like deeper quest for understanding I think the way of love um, so I just want to I think listening is we, we too rarely understand it as actually as something that um, is a very active thing and, and might and might cost us. Yeah, no, that's, that's terrific. So we've already had 45 minutes go by, so we're gonna turn to some of the questions from our audience and um, we have many viewer questions all lined up. So our first question comes from Anna Moyle and she addresses it to Luke and Anna asks, Luke, how do you respond to fellow church members who say, we don't do politics here. <laughs> that is a great question. Uh, and I've had it all my life and it always slightly drives me insane. And then I recover my sanity for a moment. Um, and uh, I know, I think there's a lot of that. Um, and I think, I think it underlies, uh, underlying it in, in my discernment is I think often in the church, we think um, we, there are two, two thoughts behind it. One is, we think of politics as kind of dirty, compromising, all about power, wicked. It's the domain of Machiavelli, I'm gonna put it in those terms, but you know, it's, 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 it entails somehow a pollution. Um, so there's that one problem. So we don't wanna do that and the gospel's got nothing to do with that world. Um, and then on the other, there's a sense in which we view politics as a failure. If, if, we're, in, if we're in politics, then some, something's failed, something's gone wrong. And I would say that actually um, on this broader, richer account of politics, I, I kind of lay out in the book that actually we are in, and this is, you know, again, this ancient philosophy, Aristotle, others make this, but I think it's there in scripture. We, we're inherently political animals because we're inherently social animals. Mm -hmm. So the negotiation of a common life just is intrinsic to the condition of being this kind of creature. And being this kind of creature is we're frail, we're fallen, we're finite, I don't know everything there is to know, you have insights about life that I can't access and I need to hear and receive from you as a gift, not as a threat. Um, and so that sense in which we're gonna have to do politics, we're going to disagree, uh, there's gonna be conflict, um, and, and, and of course, politics in, in kind of in structures that conflict. We think about the advocate system in the legal structure, it's, it's all about, conflict as the discernment of truth uh, in re jewish rabbinic tradition we have the malachet the rabbi sharp disagreement over a text as they try and work out what the word of god says think about um, in the british parliamentary system uh, we kind of write it into the fabric of parliament they the opposition sit literally opposite a sword's length away so they couldn't stab each other um and it's and 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 so that's enshrined in the building because there's something there about if we're going if we're in a quest for truth we're going to have disagreement but if, if we're going to have this kind of common life we have to have this mutual discernment and that's as true in the church as it is out in wherever and so when christians say oh we don't do politics or i don't have a politics it's a kind of denial of what it means to be this kind of creature on a journey to communion with god and and part of that journey is navigating our frailty navigating our fallenness as we seek for truth and so uh, there's a whole chapter in the book on the kind of church as a political body but I, but i wrote it because of partly in response to exactly this question which is this sense of which well we're christians we don't have politics we don't do a politics i'm like the church is a politics it's its name ecclesia in greek is the gathered assembly of the people to deliberate together not in the greek sense over the good of the city but over in the christian sense the good of the city of god and so it's it's in all our words liturgy is like it's the work of the people in politics presbyter like a whole language 
uh, think about the kingdom language, think about lordship language, think about all the language we have is deeply suffused with political meaning and valence so that, so that we can't actually understand who God is outside of political terms. So when Christians say, I don't have a politics, it's like, but then how can you talk about God and divine human relations? That, that is framed in political terms. That should shape our imaginations of how we view politics around us. And equally, I can't really understand important things about who I am in relation to God and who God is in relation to me outside of the experience of what it means to be a citizen outside of the experience of what it means to be a neighbor with others I disagree with, the kind of my Samaritans um, who, who I can, you know, who look after me, even though I disagree with them. We often look at it from the Samaritan point of view and identify as the Samaritan, but actually often we're the one cared for by the stranger who we find scandalous. Um, and that, so those experiences of, of political life are a crucial arena through which we come to understand something very, very important about what it means to be in divine human relations and what it means to be in relations with each other in a theological key. And so I, I think there's something a lot at stake in that denial because it's actually a denial of really, I think, um, the, the nature of the Christian life, which is a political life. That's great. So our next question comes from Roger Trigg. And Deandra, I think I'll toss this to you to start us off with. And Roger asks, can divisions in a democracy become so deep that there's no room left for any common ground on which we can stand to listen to others and find scope for agreement? Oh, I love this question. I mean, I think initially I automatically think of there's a, a segment of political science called policy feedback. And we basically recognize that a lot of our current political landscape is shaped by previous public policy decisions. And so I think that there are so many instances politically where we are sort of separated into winners and losers and us versus them and the ins versus the outs that create those really deep cleavages and have created really deep cleavages in society and have made it really difficult to move beyond them. And so I think you know, one of the biggest struggles we face as a democratic, you know, small d society is that we have this history where those previous political battles have left us feeling so siloed and so separated and so um, sort of marked by, marked as winners or as losers, that it makes it really difficult to reimagine ourselves and our polity in a way that's necessary to, to sort of move forward. So I, I do think those divisions are really deep. I think they're important. I don't, you know, I, I don't know that I have the perfect answer for how to get beyond them. But I think I'd also point out that in the fact that we have these sort of deep divisions, we're also dealing with um, a situation where moving forward will require redistributions of certain things. And so, you know, I think that's really hard to do if you don't, if you haven't done that listening and you don't really know that long arc of history of how we got to where we are and what policy decisions and, and previous um, sort of situations led to the current moment and the current uh, distribution of things. So, mm -hmm in order to move forward, we're going to have to look beyond those segments and the groupings that we find ourselves in and be willing to cede something. You know, in order for us to move forward into progress as a collective, we're going to all have to recognize that we have things that we might need to give up for the common good. So I hope, that's, I hope that answers that question. It's a really good question. Absolutely. So there are lots of good questions coming in. So um, I'm actually going to try to combine two questions and toss them to you, Anne, um, in hopes you can provide some insight. Uh, the first of the, the combo comes from Andrew Hart, who asks, in your judgment, what are the personal individual qualities that are necessary to cultivate a vibrant common life? And how are those individual qualities promoted in a non-coercive way? And at least somewhat related, we also have a question from Richard Miles who asks, should Christians invest in and promote civics education in schools and the general public? It seems like before we have an argument that, uh, uh, before an argument for democracy can be made, we need to understand how it works. Uh, so Anne, if you would kick us off there. 
I, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is just humility. Um, and, you know, I've often wondered <laughs> that maybe the only salvation for our society at this historical juncture is if we have some critical mass of Americans who um, have found themselves, frankly, sometimes through um, tragedy or being publicly escoriated for your own mistakes or, you know, sometimes things we would never welcome, kind of allowing us to get to the end of ourselves. And I think somehow right now, a combination of fear and distrust in both institutions and one another has led to just a, a real hunkering down posture on all sides of the political spectrum and a lot of different sort of group identity group, uh, uh, members of different um, identities. Um, and somehow there is just something in this virtue of humility that um, typically flowers when you are either serving a cause beyond yourself, when you're arm in arm with others. And humility obviously doesn't mean um, uh, giving up everything you believe to be true or, um, you know, kowtowing, uh, but, but there is a sense in which I think it um, is most sort of joyfully embodied when you feel, when you're in a community often or an institution um, where you're kind of there's a joy and a freedom somehow granted to you to consider the diversity of your environment, to consider others as having strengths you don't have, and to actually like lean into those. Um, and that's easier, I think, to do at a smaller scale than in the mass. And I think we're seeing a lot of, like when I look at health, uh, sort of social health out there, there's often like extraordinary metrics going on at local small scale levels and like ridiculously horrible metrics happening at the large mass level. And I think there's some math there that's worth everyone thinking through. Um, in terms of civics education, I used to get this question a lot when I wrote this little book about character. And yes, I can envision some revival of civics education as some kind of requirement, say, in our public ed. I think it probably needs to be textured with um, a fuller history than has often been um, shared, uh, espoused in sort of classic civics education. But um, I, I just, th I think we're in it partly because of the deluge of content out there. I'm always a fan of sort of embodying, I think you learn, there's something about sort of civic engagement and civic commitment that um, is much more caught than taught these days. And to be blunt, I probably would have yawned my way through a civics class in seventh grade or sophomore year in high school whenever they might've been offering it. Um, learning sort of about process, I think you learn so much better. I mean, I am like a huge advocate of some sort of national service program, which seems politically untenable always, but, mm -hmm sort of are there levers that enable you to engage with others who are often different from you in service of a cause greater than yourself that can have very sort of, you know, often like local manifestation and it can mean working with your local government, et cetera, um, experience, sort of many experiences of the layers of our polity. Um, but I'm probably, if there's gonna be a revival in civics ed, I would encourage civic experience first and mm -hmm. then we can tag on the flashcards to learn about the different layers of government. Fascinating. I'm just to pick up, I think that's absolutely right. I think it's absolutely right. I think um, the, it, it, because the crucial thing democratically, a lot of people talk about social capital and, and community formation. I think the, there, obviously we need communities of formation that cultivate people in the virtue. And I think a key virtue alongside humility is mercy is one we're lacking today. Um, but, but I think it's for democratic purposes, it's the experience of working across institutions or across communities and doing that kind of bridge work. And, 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 and added to that, civics education, the problem with civics education, it tends to think if I've got the theory right, or I, and it tends to focus on statecraft, and that's not the problem. Actually, the system, if it, you know, good people in it works pretty well. It's, it's that broader conception of politics and the experience of navigating difference in nonviolent ways um, and ways that actually promote mutual flourishing. That's the rare thing. And then politics isn't a theoretical knowledge. It's a practical knowledge. It's a practical wisdom. Um, and that again is a kind of ancient insight we need to recover. Um, you don't need to go to Harvard or work in a think tank to know how to do politics well, uh, or I'd add in Duke, you know, we're very good at training technocrats. Um, 
but actually it's that experience of navigating whether it's between a disability support group and the building they're in or neighbor if i turn out to the there's kids at the end of my road having of causing a fracas do i call the police or do i go and have a word if i call the police i've called in statecraft to deal with the problem and navigate and that all the that gets ramped up and that causes a problem or if i'm learning and i'll be shouted at and they swear at me i'm talking from experience um you know but but there's a different kind of quality of relationship and navigating that noise i used to do a lot of um neighborhood dispute resolution work in london um, as a mediator and 90 um, percent of neighbor conflicts often turning violent are through noise and often it was it just escalated and and that that ability to navigate the experience of working that out yourself and the and kind of DIY, I can do it for myself, is the promoter of the kind of civic trust and the kind of wily wisdom about how you do that. Don't do it on a Saturday night when my neighbors had a few cans of lager, not a good idea. Do it on a Monday morning just before we get him going to work and we can have a better chat. You know, that's a kind of wily wisdom, but that's a practical wisdom that actually is crucial to politics. And, and most politicians know that. They know it's all about the timing, the, the judgment of when to act, when not to act. And that's a practical wisdom. And, and I think that's part of the problem. We've lost that. And in that, like politics is always this dance of conflict and conciliation. And it's like we've learned the conflict bit of the dance. You know, we, we know how to do that. But we never learned how to do that. You know, we, we didn't learn the conciliation bit. And, and again, the kind of practical wisdom of when to polarize and when to depolarize in this tensional dance of conflict and conciliation is, can only be done experientially, as Anne says. Um, but yeah, but actually just one more thing, sorry, <laughs> to go back to the Roger Trigg question. I, I think in terms of, yes, democ democracies end. We see that throughout history and, and we've just seen it in, in lots of states. You can have state failure and that's part of our terror of the moment is is this very precious notion of a, of a loyal opposition. Do I have to take to the hills with my AR-15 or my AK-47 when I lose the election? Because I so distrust the opposition. Um, and that is, you can't manufacture that. That's purely based on social trust and the woven fabric of social trust that comes through this broader vision of politics. That breaks down, but the, but the paradox is, even if you collapse into civil war, at some point, you've got to do politics. At some point, the British have to no negotiate with the IRA and work out a peace accord. At some point, the, uh, the Spanish government have to negotiate with the Basques and the, you know, whoever else. And so the French and the rest of it. So, that, so, so we're, we're, all, we're, we're always at some point the demand of politics or killing and coercion is before us. So it's even when it collapses, it's still the horizon before us if we're not just gonna keep killing each other or coercing each other. So Anne, you mentioned local politics and local work and uh, we have several questions about the local. So I'm gonna to return to you and Deandra for uh, these next ones and I'm again going to combine two questions. One is from Ginny Savage who asks, which questions of common good are best answered and served at the local level and which at the state and national level? And then related to that, Amber Pearson asks, given that the most meaningful political work individuals can do is within their local communities with their neighbors, how do people commit to their first steps? And perhaps your speakers could share one or two examples from their own local context. Uh, so Anne, maybe we could start with you and then Deandra would love for you to offer some thoughts on that as well. Um, I'll take the second one. The first question is harder and Deandra, I think you've got the chops to do it in a way I don't. Um, the first question is excellent. So second, uh, and both are good questions. Um, so a couple, a couple things I was thinking about when Luke was talking about where, where you get very practiced in the conflictual element of politics, but not the, I like your arm motions, Luke, uh, the conciliation. One just secret ingredient, and this is going back to the civics thing, which leads to the second question here, is um, just love of place. And I often think um, it's just, it's, it's not a magic lever all the time, but I often wonder when we talk about civics, when we talk about civic engagement, 
uh, getting people to listen. There's something about a shared love and I, and it would be wonderful, like starting at age middle school on, um, is there a way to inspire love of this place, which usually often has not, not everywhere, but can have deep inequity in it already. I mean, there's so many pluralistic moments often in a bounded area. Um, so I just put that in that's like, the, I'm all about finding like the right tell us that will like orient everything else. And I just think that's when it comes to civic experience, that's key. So related to that, um, I, this is an example I, I probably have overused, but um, it has continued to change my own life. So I'll just say it. Um, there's a wonderful organization uh, called Community Renewal International that started in Shreveport has now gone global and would like to continue expanding in cities everywhere. And it's like a, they've modeled a demonstration city. It's kind of a reincarnation of Jane Addams Settlement House movement. And they basically took a very simple idea with, which was that we need to start, and it can sound very kumbaya at first, but we need to start with what we all have in common. And this visionary leader who happened to first be a pastor and then realized people are not actually loving neighbors out of churches. So he left the church and went just into to the Civic Square, um, Mac McCarter, he said, you know what we all have in common is the capacity to care. And so why don't I just send out tens of thousands, like hundreds of thousands of postcards into people's mailboxes in my city of Shreveport, which back in the day and still is very racially divided as a sordid racial history. Um, <clears throat> to just ask, what are you doing? What's one thing you're doing that enables you to sort of care for someone else? And it could be give, if you're in the church context, taking communion to this elderly person three blocks down or um, delivering a newspaper to this person who can't get out or you know, just name one thing to sort of concretize and it's the power of naming, power of intention. And from there, he said, look, if you're all doing this one thing on some ritualized basis, you're part of like a caring movement. And um, there's like, people have we care signs and their identity is in sort of their sense of care for neighbor. And there's some other structures around it. There's a whole sort of system of how you think about doing this across different socioeconomic pods of the city. Um, but it's probably the best example I've seen of taking something that is in with, with, within each one of us, which is they literally give lists of ideas of how you can actually just love neighbor, concrete ideas, which I think is what a lot of us yearn for. We're too embarrassed to admit we need help just getting some suggestions because you don't know if we feel paralyzed, I think, um, that has wound up leaving to an extraordinary investment in the city at large and transforming it from a very soul relational place that has led to increases in safety in certain neighborhoods, to better health outcomes, to better educational outcomes. So it's led to all of these sort of wonky metrics. Um, good wonky metrics, but from a place that's not wonky. And um, it's just, yeah, visit Shreveport for a wonderful example. That's great. Deandra. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, so from political science, there are these really interesting perspectives on the division of labor in terms of whether we ought to attend to sort of national level, sort of big efforts or more localized community or regional efforts. And I have to say, I'm, I've evolved on my position here because you know, I'm a political historian. I do a lot on the history of US social policies, especially related to education. And looking at the history, oftentimes, you know, a, a sort of devolution to local government or state governments was done because certain lawmakers wanted to maintain systems of stratification. And so they would actually try to avoid federal policies because they didn't want the federal government to come in and, and have regular, maybe they bring some redistributive policies, but then also come through with regulations that could mean something for segregated schools, for example. So oftentimes I hear some appeals to the value of community-based policymaking, and I just sort of get a little nervous because of the history. But I was recently in a conversation with a woman who is, she's a part of the global philanthropy movement. And there's this really fascinating model where some organizations actually empower local communities across the world to be, you know, to make the decisions about how aid is distributed in their communities. And the idea is local communities really know their needs better than say some, you know, remote organization in New York that could tell them what to do. And I had to like, I've been grappling with those, those competing models. And I think this actually goes back to Luke's book, you know, in the fundamental I think the, the key difference in how both of these models act is really that 
you know, I feel like the latter especially is driven by a love, like a common love and a, a, a broad sense of responsibility to the most marginalized voices. So I think, you know, when there's, when sort of the capacity to, to wield resources is driven by a true appreciation for disparity and a commitment to taking up for those who really are the least among us. You know, those are the types of policies that I think really are best suited for local grappling. Um, and then in terms of, I can give a quick example of um, something that I find really inspirational in terms of local approaches to getting things done. I have a colleague, Tony Brown, and Tony has this really fascinating approach to problem solving and to, to sort of um, helping to align those who have very different experiences and perspectives. And for him, it's all about having some sort of personal rapport. So, you know, we could go and take classes on how to solve policy and we could use algorithms, but he says, you know what, if you actually spend time and get to know somebody who's very different from you, figure out what you share in common, what you like to do together, you know, that's actually where you're going to find the common ground necessary to move the ball. So, you know, I think we're seeing this with campaigns right now, like, okay, we have social distancing, so they can't come to your door and they're probably calling you. I bet you're getting a lot of phone calls these days. Um, but even campaigning looks different because people don't want to talk to each other. Like it actually hurts a little bit to have somebody phone you in the middle of dinner. So whatever we can do, I think as a society to increase our comfort with just engaging with each other, you know, with, with Luke's example of telling the kids up the street to pipe down, I have to say, like, I am so nervous about the kids cussing me out that I'm like, I don't know if I could do that. But that's what we have to do, I think, you know, in order for our communities to move forward is to not give up on those, you know, interpersonal neighborhood level interactions. Yeah. Well, our time is rapidly running out, but Luke, I'm going to uh, direct the final question to you for just a, a quick answer, but we've had several uh, questions on this general theme. And so I'm going to read from one from Janice Freetag and another from John uh, Gallette. And Janice uh, asked about um, the tension between common good versus the kingdom of God. Uh, she asked, is it intention? Is there antagonism? Is there friendly support? And similarly, John Gallette uh, asked, how do you reconcile the view that uh, in politics we should seek the kingdom of good rather than the kingdom of God with Jesus telling us that we should seek first the kingdom of God? How do you view the kingdom of God's relationship with the common good? So given the amount of interest in that, I was hoping you could clarify before we wrap up. That's a great, no, that's a, it's a great, um, great set of questions. I, so I think in, it is two things to say on that. The first is, um, it's a question about ordering. So it's not, it's not that one replaces the other. So we can think about this in um, dialectical terms and there's political theologies which view those two things entire dialectic that one is inherent conflict with the other there's ways in which we can view uh, one as supplanting the other so we pursue the kingdom of god to the exclusion of our common life and the, and the goods we share in common with others and these are all these have all been there in the history of the church um i think uh, and again this is a kind of augustinian point and it's picked up by thomas aquinas in his understanding of the common good um and it's kind of a rich tradition of thinking of and, and I think it's that phrase, you know, seek first the kingdom of God. It's in many ways a kind of meditation on that. Seeking, putting first things first is not necessarily replacing or to the exclusion of or instead of or as an alternative to. It means putting first things first. And if I love God first and then I order all my other loves in relation to God, that's very different from if I'm pursuing the kingdom of God, that's to the exclusion of or instead of or as a replacement for the pursuit of the common good. Um, and so this sense in which uh, uh, in, I would argue in a kind of theological sense, I can't really know the common good out of its ultimate ordering to the kingdom of God but I can't know what it means to pursue the kingdom of God outside of the granular, concrete, that, you know, 
at the at, at, on the earth level of working that out through what it means to concretely in time love this person in this place at this time and and our problem is i think um we 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 create a very abstract idea of the kingdom of god and then pursue that as a program over and against the concrete realities of who i'm called to love in this place at this time you know uh, here and now um, and so, yeah, so I, I don't think it's, it's not a replacement kind of option. I think there can be, there can be moments when there's tension. Um, and so, you know, we can think of something like the Bart and Bonhoeffer and the, and the Barman declaration in the face of Nazis. Um, and, and there are these moments and part of the judgment, if you read the records of their deliberations, are we in such a moment? I think part of our problem is we jump to a kind of Lutheran here I stand moment, I can stand nowhere else, perhaps a bit too quick, quickly. We, we, we're, everything is a prophetic moment and every, and I think that's a, there's a, to, to kind of end with this, I think there's a, um, a difficult tension, if you like, where the tension lies. I think we need a certain apocalyptic vision and that's the kind of sheep and goats either or, um, God is bringing judgment on the earthly city, the book of Revelation world, um, because things like white supremacy, patriarchy, other things, these are grotesque distortions of what it means to be created in the image of God. And that apocalyptic view just renders that very starkly. So I, we need moments when we're apocalyptic. We need to have that in, it's part of the canon, if you like, it's part of the grammar of a Christian imagination of politics. But if we only have that, if everything is about sheep and goats and everything is an apocalyptic, apocalyptic moment of reckoning, we lose a sense of the tragic. We lose a sense of we're frail, we're finite, we're in need of mercy, of forgiveness, of the difficult work, the gesture of finding what will be the reconciling gesture that brings connection. Um, what, what, how do I, in a sense, do I need to give up or, or work in a way that doesn't, everyone else is losing instead of me and, and those kinds of issues. And so I think this tension between the tragic and the apocalyptic is always before us. So there is a tension between those moods, if you like, um, but I don't think there's a tension between the common good and the kingdom of God. That's about right ordering. So now, as promised, would love to give the last word, a sentence to each of our speakers. And uh, Deandra, maybe we can start with you. Sure, thank you. So I have to say, reading Luke's wonderful book has just made me, I've been sort of grappling with a Maya Angelou poem called On the Pulse of Morning. And I'll just share this, this brief line. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes, into your brother's face, your country, and say simply, very simply, with hope, good morning. That's lovely. Thanks, Deandra. Anne. I um, happen to be reading, I started with Paul in film form, so I should probably end with him in his actual words. <laughs> and I happen to be reading Ephesians this morning, and this passage, which will probably be familiar to many listeners, just felt um, very fortifying for me and I hope for you and in tune with this whole conversation. So this is Ephesians 4, 25 to 5, 2. Um, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Thanks, Anne. And Luke, the last, last word to you. 
Um, just uh, I want to pick up on um, something De Deandre said, a beautiful uh, poem there, uh, in this theme of hope. And I think it's something I've been thinking about a lot in the current moment. It's, it's we say these words about listening, we say these words about love, we say this can sound like large abstract nouns. And I think in we, we are at a particular cultural historical moment, if things do feel very fraught, it feels like there's a lot at stake um, in this election. And there is, and that's not that we shouldn't underestimate that. Um, and I think a lot of Christians, wherever they come from on the ideological spectrum, are deeply worried. Uh, and, and I think they, they have good cause to be worried. But it, I think it's exactly that moment. And, and in an honest reckoning with our own sense of anxiety and fears, and often justified fears, um, whether local or national, that is when this very difficult gift of the spirit, the gift of hope, is when we have to really rest in that. And it is a hard gift, but it's the gift that actually says, despite what I see around me, despite the, the, my own sense of um, dis, dis, kind of distraughtness and grief, I, there is a hope in Christ that all things will be reconciled in Christ. And that the, the world, as I see it, doesn't determine, doesn't have the final word on reality. There is a deeper truth and a larger reality that I am a participant in and a witness to. And, and my calling is to bear with that hope in the midst of what are very challenging times and will, I think, economically get even more challenging. And I think it is a difficult gift, but it is a gift that sustains us. And so my, my plea and in word of encouragement, recognizing it, it's a hard word to hear, is that word of hope that Deandre pointed to um, as a beautiful, if often hard gift to rest in for these times ahead. And so I just say that as a prayer and as a call to really discover what it means to hope in Christ uh, today. Luke, Deandra, and Anne, thanks so much for your thoughts and your insights. To all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great weekend.